Hi everyone, welcome to Temple Tales. Uh, my name is Anna Judson and I'm here with Michael Loy. We're both researchers based in the British School at Athens. And today we're gonna to be talking about the myths and archeology span of two classical Greek religious sites, Olympia and Eleusis. Yeah, so we're actually gonna be starting from Athens today where both Anna and I are set at the moment. Um, if we went down to the site of the Kerimikos, to the Potter's District um, of Athens, and we left along the sacred way that begins there, and we walked about 20 kilometers to the northwest, we would arrive at the site of Eleusis at uh, modern day Elefsina. So here on the left, we've got a picture um, from Athens, from the Kerimikos. You can see we're in Athens. You can see the Acropolis in front of you with a Parthenon temple on the top. Um, and this is the sacred way. So we're actually walking back towards the picture there. And we're arriving at Eleusis here on the right. And this might be one of the first views we get of the site as we walk in along the sacred way. And there are two things that we can see that we're gonna look at a little bit um, in our podcast. The first thing is that cave uh, directly in front of us. And then the second thing is an area just a little bit up to the left where you can see um, lots of uh, old broken uh, stones, lots of pieces of architecture. Once there would have been a big temple there, but there aren't remains there anymore. We're gonna come back to that a little bit later. Um, but first of all, let's talk a little bit about this cave that is directly in front of us. This cave is known as the Plutonium. Um, so that's named after Pluto, uh, Roman name of the god Hades. Uh, the god um, of the underworld, um, because this cave is one of the places um, that uh, ancient people believe might have been an entrance to the underworld. And there were various entrances uh, throughout the Greek and Roman world. For example, the author Strago tells us that there was another entrance in Italy at Lake Vernos, and there was actually poisonous gases kind of emitting uh, from uh, this cave and any birds that flew over the top, they would get intoxicated and some of them fell out the sky. Um, there's no evidence for uh, toxic gases spewing out of this cave, but it is a cave that was believed to be an entrance to the underworld. Um, and the reason that there might be an entrance to the underworld at this very site is because uh, it's connected to some of the stories that get told about Eleusis. Yeah, so if we want to, to learn more about the myths that are connected with this site, um, we need to look at a source, at a poem called the Homeric Hymn to Demeter. Um, as the name suggests, this is a poem in praise of the goddess Demeter, the goddess of um, fertility and, and agriculture. Uh, it's called Homeric because it's in the same kind of language and poetic style as the uh, Homeric poems, the Iliad and Odyssey. It's a bit later than those poems. It was probably composed in the early 6th century BCE. Um, and this poem tells us uh, the myth of how um, Demeter's daughter Persephone was uh, abducted by Hades. Um, the quote on the screen tells us how Persephone was picking flowers, roses, crocus, and beautiful violets. Hades was riding on a chariot drawn by immortal horses. He seized her against her will, put her on his golden chariot, and drove away as she wept. And uh, the picture on this slide is a Roman sarcophagus uh, from the about 200 uh, CE, which shows uh, Hades there in his chariot with four horses and he's uh, grabbed Persephone, who is kind of looking frantically back um, at her companions as she is carried off. Obviously Demeter is not very happy about the fact that her daughter's been abducted. She doesn't know where she's gone. She starts wandering around the world uh, trying to find her um, and mourning um, as she goes. Um, and again, the poem goes on to tell us that golden haired Demeter was wasting away with yearning for her daughter she made that year the most terrible one for mortals. Demeter, she with the beautiful garlands in her hair, kept the seeds covered underground. Many a curved plough was dragged along the fields by many an ox, all in vain. Many a bright grain of wheat fell into the earth, all for nothing. So Demeter, the goddess of agriculture, because she's in mourning, she causes a famine over the whole world. Um, and as she's wandering around the earth looking for her daughter, eventually she ends up in Eleusis um, and she's initially in disguise, but then she's revealed to the people of Eleusis to be a goddess. Um, and, and when they find out who she is, she instructs them to build a temple in their city. So she tells them, let a great temple with a great altar at its base be built by the entire community, make it at the foot of the Acropolis and its steep walls, 
make it loom over the well of Calicoron on a prominent hill, and I will myself instruct you in the sacred rites so that in the future you may perform the rituals in the proper way. So we've got an origin story here for the foundation of a religious site in Eleusis. Um, Demeter is telling them to build a temple. So we did mention that temple a little bit earlier when we first walked into the site of Eleusis. And what we've got here on the right is a reconstruction drawing of what the whole site might have looked like um, at its heyday. Um, and on the left, uh, we've got various phases, uh, the ground plan of various phases um, of this temple called the Telesterion, um, which is the big temple right in the center of the site that's circled in red. So that's the big uh, main temple of the site. Um, so this temple gets uh, rebuilt a few times um, over a few generations. And um, you can see that the temples here are named um, after the various statesmen who were in charge um, in Athens uh, at the time that these temples were built. So named after Solon, Pisistratus, uh, Pericles, for example. Um, what do these temples have in common with one another? Well, we can see over time the temples are getting bigger and bigger. Um, most of them, apart from uh, the very first uh, temple and the third phase of the temple, they're all square shaped uh, temples. Um, and we can see that they've got uh, this line of columns on the inside of the temple um, supporting the roof. Um, these temples would have been oriented east-west. Um, they would have been made in a Doric architectural style, um, and they would have had some of the features that we associate with um, other kind of temples that we see all over the Greek mainland. So they would have had this three-step stylobate, a kind of three-step base leading up uh, to the temple. Um, there were uh, parts of the temple that were decorated. So the big triangular part at the front of the temple that is called the pediment, um, that would probably have been decorated in some way or form. Um, when archaeologists have been excavating at this site, they found pieces of architectural sculpture, um, including the head of a ram, um, sheep, uh, ram's horns, um, not uh, uh, any um, pictures of gods that we might see on pediments at other sites, but you know we, we do seem to have um, possibly some sculptures of animals that decorated uh, some of these uh, temple pediments. Um, but as I say, there is something a little bit different about these temples compared to other temples that we might see on the Greek mainland. We're used to seeing rectangular shaped temples um, where what uh, the main purpose of some of these temples is, is to, to house a cult image statue. Um, what we've got here is a very square shaped temple. The space in the middle is occupied by those columns. And we've also got this area along the outside, which almost looks like a seating area. And um, we're not entirely certain uh, what went on at this temple. We're not sure why this temple looks so different to other temples on the Greek mainland, but it might be that the design of the temple was connected to the things that went on in this temple. Um, and we're gonna talk about uh, ritual activities here in a little short while. Um, so it's possible that this uh, stepped area around the outside of the temple that we can both see in a modern photograph and from an older photograph, um, it's possible that this was a seating area where people could sit and watch something that was happening um, in the middle uh, of the temple. Um, a few ground plans um, also reconstruct an altar right in front of the temple. There isn't archaeological evidence for um, an altar, but that is something that was mentioned uh, in that text that Anna was just talking about. Um, so, uh, you know, some people think that that might be what there was here. Um, but there is also plenty of evidence both from within and around the temple um, for little votive offerings, for little objects that are being offered to the gods, possibly to Demeter, um, possibly to Persephone. And of course, those two goddesses are very important figures at this site. Um, and of course, their story isn't quite finished yet. Yeah, so we're going to continue with, with the myth. We're going to think a bit more about what the, the general themes might be of the cult that was located at this site. Um, 
we've already seen that Demeter is the goddess of fertility, plants growing, agriculture. Um, and, and that theme is, is going to turn out to be very important. So uh, Demeter's instructed the people of Eleusis to build this temple, but she still hasn't found her daughter. She's still in mourning. The whole world is still suffering from a famine. And eventually uh, Zeus, the king of the gods, says this can't go on anymore. He sends the messenger god Hermes, who is also the god who um, escorts souls down to the underworld when they die, to bring Persephone back from the underworld. And that's the scene that we see here on this uh, vase from Athens from about 500 BCE. Um, the scene is set in the underworld by the figure on the right, who is um, Sisyphus, who uh, famously was punished in the underworld by being made to roll a large boulder up a hill and it would always roll back down just before he got to the top. So there he is rolling his boulder. So in the middle is Persephone, and she's looking back towards Hermes, who's about to escort her out. And then Hades is on the left, who's shown as this kind of wizened looking old man with long white hair. Unfortunately, while Persephone was in the underworld, she has, she's, hasn't eaten or drunk anything most of the time that she's been there, because if she does, she knows she's going to have to stay there forever. But at one point, um, she's, she's tricked into eating a handful of pomegranate seeds. Um, and here we have um, a more modern uh, image this time, uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti's uh, pre-Raphaelite painting of uh, Persephone, or, or Prosopine, her, her Latin name, uh, and she's, she's holding a pomegranate. Um, maybe she's, she's just about to eat from it, or maybe she's just eaten from it and has, has realized what's happened. So because of these pomegranate seeds, um, Persephone goes back to the upper world, but she can't stay there all the time. So used decrees that she's going to have to return for part of the year. So part of every year she'll be above the ground with her mother, and part of every year she'll be below ground with Hades. And this is the origin myth for why we have seasons. During the spring, Persephone comes back from the underworld and she brings life back to the world. Plants start growing. At the end of autumn, she then has to go back down um, to the underworld and everything dies and you have winter when nothing grows. Um, back in the myth, um, at this point, you know, Amita has been reunited with her daughter, so she puts an end to the famine. And more than that, she at this point is when she gives humans the gift of agriculture, of knowing how to, to plant and look after crops. So this um, drinking cup, which is, is also Athenian and from about 500 BCE, shows, um, shows this gift of agriculture to humans. We have um, in the middle a human king called Triptolemos, um, who is the one who's gonna um, be sent around the world to tell humans how to uh, farm. Uh, he's been given this sort of winged snaky chariot to fly on. He's holding um, some crops. On the right, uh, Persephone is pouring something out of a jug for him, some water, some wine, maybe. Um, on the left, Demeter is standing behind him and they're both holding torches. Um, and on the, the far right, uh, that figure of a woman is the personification of Eleusis. Um, we know this because they all have their names. There's a bit small C in this picture, but they all have their names written next to them. So we have a close connection of the story of Demeter and Persephone and the related cult of Eleusis with this um, agricultural fertility. Um, but not just, uh, but it's not just um, that that's, that's important in this, uh, in this religious site. So the Homeric hymn goes on to tell us that um, straight away she, that's Demeter, sent up the harvest from the land with its rich clods of earth and all the white earth was laden with leaves and blossoms. So the famine is over. Then Demeter went to the kings so Triptolemus and other kings. She revealed to them the way to perform the sacred rites and she showed the ritual to all of them, the holy ritual, which is not at all possible to disregard, to find out about or to speak out about. Great awe for the gods prevents any speaking out. Blessed is the one among earthbound mortals who has seen these things. So as well as giving humans the gift of agriculture, Demeter is giving humans the gift of the Eleusinian rites, the Eleusinian mysteries, as they're called. Um, the mysteries because, um, you're not allowed to talk about them. People who have been initiated can't let the uninitiated know. People who haven't been initiated aren't allowed to find out the secrets of what's done in this, uh, in this cult as part of their rituals. Um, so we know it's connected to fertility. Agricultural symbols are important. Michael mentioned the, the sculptures of animals um, that have been found on the site. And we know it's connected to a sort of idea of like spiritual rebirth after death with Persephone comes back from the underworld. That's connected both to the seasons and to the idea of, you know, what happens to your soul after you die. If you're initiated, you know, 
better things are going to happen to you after you die than if you're not. Um, but because of this mystery status, um, people, you know, we don't have so many texts that kind of describe what happens in the course of an actual celebration that might take place in the, in the Telesterion, in the temple. It's very difficult for us to know exactly what people um, were doing and exactly what they believed about what they were doing in this temple. Exactly. These mysteries are a mystery to us in some ways. And to find out what happened, we have to use other kind of sources and read in between the lines sometimes. Um, and one of the ways that we do know a little bit about what happened um, at uh, the uh, mysteries um, is by looking at more kind of formal accounting records. Um, so what do we know? Well, we know that there were two celebrations, the lesser mysteries that took place around about springtime. We know almost nothing about what happened then, but we know there was also a greater mysteries that took place in September, October, um, around about the time of the harvest, um, around about this time of agricultural rebirth in uh, the year's calendar. Um, and during this time, there was a holy truce. Um, so an invitation was sent around to all states who were going to participate in the mysteries, um, and they weren't allowed to break the peace between one another um, during this period leading up to the mysteries. There would be processions towards the site, like that procession that we did at the start um, of this podcast, going to the site of Eleusis. Um, sacrifices would be made, prayers would be said, um, hymns would be sung. Um, and when everyone came to Eleusis, something probably happened in the Telesterium. We think that maybe sacred objects or hiera would have been revealed um, to uh, ritual participants um, by a high priest. This could have happened at the Telesterium. Remember that nice seating area. Maybe that's a place where you can gather everyone together um, and the priest can show off these sacred objects. And we think that there were um, two, possibly three priests, one representing Demeter, one representing Persephone, and one representing a local goddess. So as I say, this information comes from um, sets of kind of accounting, financial um, or record keeping inscriptions. So we've got one set of inscriptions from around 510 to uh, 500 um, and another from 500 to 480. Um, the first one is on the prerequisites um, of the priesthood. Um, so that tells us that there were priests involved and we know what kind of people were allowed to be priests in these uh, mysteries. And then the second is on festival regulations, but both of these inscriptions are really quite short. So we're not entirely sure what was happening at the end of the sixth, start of the fifth century in terms of these mysteries. Round about the year 460, we've got another inscription. Again, it's financial. It um, tells us the amount that should be paid to each of the people who are acting as priests um, in these mysteries. So again, it confirms by reading through the lines that these priests were involved and were quite central um, to the mysteries that were celebrated. Um, and then we've got an inscription from the early fourth century BC, which um, tells us about what went on in the classical period. Um, it's got four lines or so devoted to those heralds that are being dispatched to announce this sacred truce um, so that there could be 30 days of celebration taking place. And um, it suggests that when these heralds arrived at the States, they were going to be paid in some kind of feast or they would get, receive some kind of hospitality from the States who received them. And it also suggests that there was a set of penalties or punishments for any States who broke that idea of the sacred peace. But unfortunately, the inscription uh, is broken around that part. So we don't know precisely uh, what those penalties and punishments might have been. So all in all, we actually know relatively little um, about what was going on at this site. We've got bits of archaeology, we've got bits of story, we've got bits of accounting records, um, and it's quite tricky to actually put some of these things um, together. Um, so we're going to move on from Eleusis at this point and look at a different site where um, it is a little easier to put some of these things together. Yep. So as you can see, um, here's the map again showing Eleusis there quite near Athens. We're now going to go all the way down to the other side of the Peloponnese, 
and we're going to go to the site of Olympia, which of course is um, best known for being the home of the Olympic Games, which we're going to come on to a little bit at the end of the talk. But first we're going to talk about the religious aspects of the site of Olympia. Yes, yeah, so we'll start by looking at the site plan of what the, uh, what the site of Olympia looked like. And the main religious center is an area called the Altis, which is that area right in the center um, of the site. Uh, you can see it's got this um, rectangular, kind of off rectangular um, parabolos wall built around it, but a very large temple in the middle uh, dedicated to the god Zeus. And um, we've got another temple a bit further to the north dedicated to Hera. And then just outside that parabolos wall, a little bit further to the north and at the foot of Mount Kronos, we've got lots of little treasuries um, dedicated by lots of the different states who participated in the Olympic Games. Um, but we'll talk about this Temple of Zeus a little bit first, one of the largest uh, temples in our data set of uh, Greek temples. Um, it was built around about the year 470 to 465 and um, built out of limestone and faced with a nice material called stucco, which makes it look uh, kind of shiny like marble, but it's made by uh, made of a cheaper and more readily available rock, the limestone. Um, it had uh, this group of uh, Doric columns around the outside. It was a peripteral temple, which means it's got uh, columns all the way outside. It's got six along the shorter side, 13 columns along the longer side. And parts of this temple were decorated with marble sculpture. Um, so there were uh, marble metopes. A metope is a square block which has an image on it. So if we look at this image on the right here, this reconstruction drawing of the temple, we can see directly above the columns and below the triangular pediment, we've got this area where we've got these three lines together, these three uh, architectural pieces, that's called a triglyph. And then between each triglyph, we've got a space. That square space is where the metope goes, or the metope. Um, the metopes at this site were made from a very uh, expensive and luxurious marble from the island of Paros. And there were 12 of them, and they showed the 12 labors of Heracles. Uh, this was one of the first time, uh, one of the first times that all 12 labors were put together as a canonical group uh, before people had told stories about these labors, but they weren't kind of group of 12 together. And then above those metopes in the pediment, so in that triangular area at the top of the temple, just beneath the roof, um, both the east and the west end of the temple had more Parian marble, uh, more marble sculpted figures. Um, at the west end, we've got a scene of Apollo in the middle, surrounded by uh, lapiths and centaurs fighting with one another after the centaurs um, interrupted a wedding party that the Lapiths were celebrating. And at the east end of the temple, um, we've got some figures who we're going to learn a little more about now. Um, we have uh, Pelops and uh, Oenomaeus and uh, Hippodamia. So uh, these are figures who are very important to the story of Olympia. Yeah, so to understand the, the sculptures on this pediment, again, we've got to go back to the, the origin story of or the site of Olympia. And this, this starts with um, a man called Tantalus, who um, is a great friend of the gods. He's kind of favored by all the gods, but he gets arrogant. And he decides to test whether the gods are really all knowing because he doesn't think they are. And the way he decides to test this is that he kills his uh, small son Pelops and he cuts him up and cooks him in a stew and invites the gods to a feast where he serves this stew. Um, of course all the gods being all-knowing all notice immediately um, except for one. This just ties back into the myth of Eleusis because at this point Demeter is still wandering around looking for her daughter. She's still in mourning and because of this she's a bit distracted and so she eats a bite of the stew but nobody else does. Um, they bring Pelops back to life um, Demeter, it turns out, has eaten his shoulder, so they give him a new shoulder made of ivory. Um, Tantalus, meanwhile, is sent to the underworld to be punished. And so here we have um, another Roman sarcophagus uh, showing three famous punishments in the underworld. On the left, we've got Sisyphus again. We saw him on a vase a little while ago. Here he is um, holding his boulder above his head. 
In the middle, we've got someone called Ixion who was punished by being tied to a giant wheel. And on the right, we have Tantalus who's standing in a pool of water and trying to drink from it. His punishment was, and because he's created this kind of horrible perversion of a feast, he's forever gonna be hungry and thirsty. And he's standing in this pool of, of delicious fresh water, but as soon as he bends down to drink, the water moves away and he can't drink it. And above the pool, there are fruit trees, um, you know, branches hanging down, but as soon as he goes to pick a fruit to eat it, the branches move away and he can't reach it. And this is where we get the word being tantalized from. Tantalus is being tantalized forever um, in Hades. So back to Pelops. Pelops, um, who has now been brought back to life by the gods, grows up, wants to get married. The person he wants to marry is a princess called Hippodamea. Um, and Hippodamea is the daughter of a king called Enomaus, who doesn't really want her to get married. And so what Enomaus says is, my daughter will marry the man who can beat me in a chariot race. Um, so any suitor that comes along, Enomaus ch challenges him to a race. When the suitor loses, as they all do, Enomaus kills him. Um, so it's a bit of a dangerous activity trying to marry Hippodamia. Pelops decides he doesn't much want to be killed for losing a chariot race. And so what he does is he bribes um, Enomaus' charioteer. So this vase here, which is um, from Italy, um, has, these, has, a, has a black background with red figure painting. Um, in the middle, we've got Pelops, who's sitting on a stool, and he's getting himself ready for the chariot race. We've got Hippodamia watching him um, on the left, and then behind her is her mother, Sterope. Uh, on the right, we've got Myrtilos, the charioteer, and you can see he's holding a wheel. So he's holding one of the wheels that he's going to sabotage um, Inamas' chariot by replacing the pins that hold the wheel onto the axle with wax. So everything's going to look okay, but once the chariot starts going, the wax is going to melt, the wheels will fall off. This is exactly what happens. Enomaus falls out of his chariot, he's killed, Pelops wins the race, marries Hippodamia. And so here we have a closer up view of, this, of the sculptures on this pediment, which are now um, in the Olympia Museum. In the middle, uh, without a head now, we have Zeus, to whom the temple is dedicated. On either side of him, we've got Pelops and Hippodamia, and Enomaus and Sterope, and then on either side of them, we have horses for the chariot race. So this is presumably the moment kind of when everyone's preparing for the race being, being shown on this pediment. So uh, Pelops um, is one of the figures who is shown on the temple pediment, but this isn't the only place in the site of Olympia where we can find Pelops. Um, there's an area just to the northwest of the temple of Zeus, which is known as the uh, Pelop uh, Pelopion, um, which uh, was an area dedicated uh, to Pelops. Um, there are remains of a very, very early tumulus, so a mound um, that was built up here um, from a very long time before the first temple was ever built at this site, back in the early Bronze Age. Um, according to stories, this mound was built by Heracles himself in honor of Pelops. Heracles was also meant to have brought uh, the olive to this region of Greece and uh, the area around Olympia is also an area that does a lot of um, uh, farming of the olives still uh, to this day. Um, and by the time we get to the period when uh, the Temple of Zeus is being built, um, this area, not only was there a previous tumulus here, um, but there had probably been an ash altar, um, an altar where people had burnt lots of things in honor of the God, and then there was a wall, a pentagonal shaped wall put up around the area. So that um, is what it looked like, what went on here. Well, as I said, people would have offered things. Um, there are lots of very small bronzes and terracottas that have been found in this area, probably very small gifts that had been given to the God. Um, sacrifices would have been made here um, every year, apparently, Black Ram was sacrificed in honor of Pelops. Um, but the important thing, really, to remember about this part of the site is that it is a very old, very ancient part of the site um, that the people visiting this part of the site would have thought that the story of Pelops, you know, extended back generations and generations and generations. Um, and of course, what happens when you tell stories over generations and generations and generations? 
And sometimes people start to tell different versions of the same story. Yeah, so we often think we know kind of the version of any Greek myth, you know, the popular one that always gets told, but it's actually pretty common for there to be lots of different versions of myths because they are stories that people tell. Um, and if we look at a literary source here, this is a poem or an extract from a poem by a poet called Pindar, who wrote um, victory poems for people who, well, who won um, events in the Olympic Games. And this is his first Olympian ode, which he wrote in 476 BCE for the uh, king of Syracuse, Heron, who'd won uh, in a horse race. And this tells a rather different version of the myth. Um, first of all, Pindar says, it's nonsense to say that Tantalus chopped up his son and, and fed him to the gods. You know, Tantalus he, he wouldn't have done that. He just put on a feast for the gods. Um, and at this feast, what happened was that Poseidon saw um, Tantalus' son Pelops and desired him. And so carried him off for a while to Olympus um, in a similar kind of way to how Persephone was abducted by Hades. Uh, eventually Poseidon brings him back. So instead of being dead and coming back to life, he's been on Olympus and come back to earth. Um, and then what happens when Pelops wants to marry Hippodamia is he doesn't go and, and bribe someone to sabotage a chariot and therefore kill Enomaz. He goes and asks Poseidon to help. So what this poem tells us is that um, Pelops approached the gray sea alone at night and called upon the deep thundering lord of the fine trident. He said to him, if the loving gifts of Aphrodite count at all for gratitude, Poseidon, come, hold back the bronze spear of Enomaz and speed me in the swiftest of chariots to Elis and bring me to victorious power, for he has killed 13 suitors and so puts off the marriage of his daughter. The god honored him with the gift and winged horses that never tire. He did mighty Enomaz and won the maiden as his wife. So, rather different version of the kind of foundation of the site of Olympia, but whichever version you go with, the chariot race is the central feature. And um, here we see that chariot race on this, this pair of Roman terracotta plaques. We have on the left, Pelops getting into a chariot with Hippodamia, and on the right, we have Enomas and Myrtilos in the chariot. So this chariot race is the foundation of the sporting events of the Olympic Games, which in the ancient world, chariot races were a major feature. Alternatively, if you go with the version of the myth where um, Pelops does kill Enomaz, um, some versions have it that he then organizes funeral games. So chariot races and other athletic events at the funeral as a kind of way of atoning for the fact that he's murdered him. And those might be the origin of the games. But either way, um, the myths of this site and the myths depicted on the temple and connected to the religious buildings are fundamentally connected with the other activity of Olympia, namely the games. So yeah, we'll finish off just by looking at two of the areas that are connected with the Olympic Games. Um, as we talked a little bit about earlier, the centre of the site was the kind of religious focus, um, and then a lot of the public buildings um, were placed around the outside uh, of uh, the site. Sorry, I should say that religious buildings are public buildings, so sort of the, the more secular kind of buildings to do with the Games are those that are placed towards the outside uh, of the site. Um, so up in the northwest part, uh, just by the river uh, Cladeos, um, we've got um, a palaestrum, which is uh, the wrestling area. Um, you can see a picture of part of this that has been uh, excavated and uh, reconstructed, these columns put back up. Um, we've got uh, columns laid out um, in a square, um, and there would have been little rooms um, behind all of these columns. There's a large open space in the center. Um, this is where uh, the people who were wrestling um, would have uh, done that, so where they would have practiced with one another, um, remembering, of course, that uh, the wrestling was an activity like other sports at the Olympic Games that would have taken place nude. Um, but of course, when it got a little bit too warm, or if the weather even got bad and started raining, um, those people in the centre, in the open courtyard, it wouldn't have been roofed, it would have been completely open uh, to the elements, people could have retreated to those rooms at the back, uh, maybe where they could have bathed, where they could have chatted, uh, or maybe where they could have done other things, where they could have swapped verses or maybe philosophised uh, with one another. Um, and then another uh, part of the site 
where sporting activities took place um, is in the stadium, which is over on the other side to the northeast of the site, just at the foot of Mount Kronos. Um, the stadium here at Olympia um, was probably constructed in this form around 560 uh, BC. Um, and not only was it a large open space for athletes to uh, run and compete, um, but archaeologists have found about 200 wells in the area. So that would have provided water not only for the people competing, but also for the spectators. Um, and there are some estimates that up to about 20,000 spectators um, could have gathered around the stadium here, sitting on the grassy banks uh, around the running track and also going all the way up to Mount Kronos as well. Um, the size of the stadium um, is relative to uh, Heracles' feet. Um, apparently, um, the uh, length of the stadium was measured out to be 600 ancient feet. Um, in our measurements today, that's about 192 meters long um, and about 30 meters wide. And that 30 meters wide gives enough space for about 20 runners to line up along the line and compete with one another. So we've taken um, quite a bit of a survey of two sites now of Olympia and Eleusis, where we've seen there are all kinds of evidence playing against one, uh, against one another. We've got archeological evidence, we've got evidence from these myths, we've got these stories, and sometimes they match up a little bit in ways that we can see, and sometimes um, what we can see on the ground does something a little bit different to what we see in the myth. And um, so that leaves us with kind of one big hanging question, you know, when we can see some similarities and differences like this, and that's, you know, do you think that ancient people would have believed these myths? You know, the people who came to Eleusis and Olympia, do you think they would have believed that those stories we've talked about today would have been true? It's a very difficult question to try and answer, because, of course, what we have is a literary retelling of a myth or um, a sculpture or a, a vase painting, which we interpret, you know, which we, we read, if you like, through the version of the myth that we happen to know from literature. We don't interpret that the same way necessarily that an ancient person looking at it would. So we can't necessarily say, yes, someone who came to Eleusis as an initiate in the cult literally believed exactly the version of, of in the Homeric hymn, or, or yes, somebody competing in a chariot race literally believed in Pelops and Ina Mars competing. What we can see is the kind of ways that people are using these myths. So the, the Homeric hymn might well actually have been composed to be recited and performed at Eleusis itself. The amount of kind of local references, it's talking about local geography, it's talking about the foundation of the cult really quite specifically suggests that that may well be the context um, that it was created in. And so that's an instance of people in Eleusis in maybe the early sixth century using these myths to tell a story about the way they wanted to think about and, and present the origins of their cult. Um, with the myths of Olympia, with these two different versions that we have, we can see something a bit different. We can see the way that people might have exploited the existence of different versions of myths, depending on the kind of story they want to tell. So, so you can see perhaps that if you're writing a victory poem about how great it is that a king has won a race at Olympia, you might be more attracted to the version of the myth where, you know, the great founder of the site of Olympia and the Olympic Games is a hero who was helped by the gods to win a race, rather than the version where he was chopped up and put in a stew and then later goes on to kill his prospective father-in-law. Which is not to say that the more gruesome version of the myth was never told at Olympia, because I'm sure there were all sorts of versions told at and about these sites by people thinking about how these sites came to be and how their activities at them originated. But that, I think, is the way we need to use these myths when we're looking at you know, them in, in, in conjunction with the archaeology, not to say that this is you know, fact or fiction, people believed them or, or didn't believe them, but to say this is a, a way that people told their own stories and the stories of the places that they went to the places that they worshipped at. Yeah, and of course, this is quite a broad open question on whether 
these ancient people would have believed these stories that we've looked at today. And um, we'd love to hear other people's opinions on these as well. So uh, if you've watched this podcast and you have some opinions that you'd like to uh, share with us, um, we'd be very happy to uh, hear from you. Um, there are a couple of ways to get in touch uh, with us on the screen now, either by email, uh, a.judson at bsa.ac.uk or m.loy at bsa.ac.uk um, or over Twitter at Anna P. Judson or at Dr. Michael Loy. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed uh, listening to uh, this podcast on Temple Tales, looking at the sites of Eleusis and Olympia, and we hope that you'll continue to enjoy learning lots more about the mythology and the archaeology of these two very fascinating uh, Greek places. <laughs>